What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Super dope episode for you. I have Larry of Haller's Cafe on the show. Super triple, quadruple OG in the vintage game. Okay, little quick bio on Larry. Started selling vintage in 1987. He is dubbed the king of vintage. He has two vintage books. Actually, he said three vintage books he has out on this episode. We talk about early days at the Rose Bowl. We talk about finding a whole dry goods store full of Levi's double X's and blue Wrangler bluebells and all kinds of sick denim. We talk about um, the Japanese influence in the market. We talk about we talk about everything. Larry has been in the game forever. To myself, to a lot of other dealers, he is the man. He is the man for high-end vintage, period. He's been selling to brands like Polo for years. And it's a wicked episode. I'm super stoked on this one. But before we get into the episode, this is a podcast funded by the people, okay? It's funded by you guys. Big shout out to all my Patreon members. I appreciate you all so much. You don't even know. And yeah, if you want to support, please do so. You can get the Patreon link down below. Now, it's not just about support. It's about getting involved. We have a mastermind group that you will get access to and all kinds of other good perks. Click down below. I don't really have any news today, guys. I'm just fired up about this episode. This is a really good one. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Larry, for coming on the show. I have known you now basically since probably pre-Rose Bowl, probably before we started doing the Rose Bowl. We knew yeah, you so. because you we would sell to you. We met you probably through online sales. And then eventually right. we just became kind of, you were the guy we knew to sell certain product to. Right. right. And I, I think you are. you were probably that for a lot of people in that air or still are maybe I don't, I don't really know where your business is right now but you were that guy and we, we always looked up everybody including myself and jesse looked up to you as like the the goat i would say which is like the greatest always had the best stuff you were the man you were like and there's a book king of vintage and it i still hold that true for you so i'm just really excited to have you on the show to talk about uh, it's nice to say thank you yeah Thank you. Yeah, that was a that was a fun time. It was a fun time. Uh, it was fun. It was fun yeah. uh, for us, for sure. I learned so I learned a lot from you just from selling to you, and then later on, like seeing you at the Rose Bowl and all those years, and um, yeah, this, this is an exciting episode for me because I have a lot of good questions. No, thanks, thanks. I'm happy to, happy to be here and do it. Awesome. So let's let's go back to the beginning. I've read somewhere that yep. you started. As early as 1986, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. yeah. Yes. So give us a little bit of a history of like how you got in it. Like what was it that brought you into the business and like what those early days were like? So like poverty brought me into the business. So what, what I mean by that is, is that I always liked clothes, just, just like clothes. As a person, I like to buy clothes. I couldn't afford new clothes. And if you went out to look for new clothes in the mid 80s, it was the whole disco hippie layover thing. You couldn't find natural fiber clothing, for instance. If you went to look for a suit, which in those days I was into suits, if you went to look for a suit, it was always poly blend. It was always flared. It was always just essentially junk and a lot of money. And so somehow I started figuring out going to thrift stores, kind of figuring out 
what I thought was cool, what was of value, what was interesting, and what I like for myself. But if you do that long enough, pretty soon you realize, well, this is very cool. I don't want it for me, but I think I could sell it. And so that's what I did is I just started, you know, going around, finding stuff. If I didn't want to keep it, I'd try to sell it to friends in those days. I did consignment at a vintage store, that kind of stuff. And so really, I think what attracted me to business one is, is I was a waiter at the time. And I knew what it was like to have to kiss somebody's ass for a $3 tip for, you know, an hour and a half while they sat there and ate their salad and stuff versus going out to a thrift store. I mean, those days I would buy something if I could make 25 cents on it. If I bought it for a dollar, I knew I could sell it for a dollar and 25, I was going to buy it because my thought was if I saw 25 cents on the ground, I'd pick it up. Why not? Why not do that? And I think, I think for me at the time that helped give me some edge because certainly there were guys, there were some guys in the business at the time, not, not a lot of guys, but there were guys and there were guys who you know, didn't want to buy stuff unless they doubled their money. And I thought, yeah, I hope to double my money, but I'll make what I can. And that mentality sort of is something I've kept throughout the business. Now, sometimes it doesn't pay off. You buy a piece for 10,000 and sell it for 10,250. Somehow that doesn't quite make as much sense. But nonetheless, that is the kind of mentality that I've sort of... But I, I do think that, like you said, that gives you an edge. And I've known that about you and other people in the business nowadays do run by that business model. But it's not, it's not the popular business model. No. And it gives you the edge in buying because you can move more and you can, you can buy more and people are going to sell to you because they know you're paying that fair price. And I think that's always yeah. been something about you, why people probably came to you for all those years because you were paying the fairest price. You know, I did. And in fact, I, you know, I, I would keep in mind that I would pay up to what I could sell it for. Now, ideally I'd, be making money on a piece. That was always, of course, my goal. It was business. But I love the stuff. And also, I value the relationships. And I was never one, and I'm still not someone who is shrewd. I, I'm not a shrewd guy. There are guys in the business now and guys in the business forever who've made way more money than I've made because they're shrewd and they're perfectly capable of beating somebody down on price to make whatever they think they have to make on it. And I'm not making a value judgment there. That's a perfectly legitimate way to do business. And in fact, that's the normal business model. If you look at any retail outlet, they don't buy at 80% and try and make 20%. That's not a sustainable model. But with our business, and partly yeah. because of the relationship, I mean, early on in the business when I, when I got in, and for a long time, there were no cell phones. I know that's going to shock a lot of people. There were no cell phones. There was no internet. There were no portable computers. So all the business was basically done face-to-face. -face. It was done by reputation. It was done by you knowing something more that maybe than somebody else knew. I mean, when I got in the game, the first guy who ever told me about vintage, like what difference between a Big E and anything else, swore me to secrecy. I mean, just literally like you cannot tell anybody else this because yeah. that's how few people knew it. Now, I think a lot of people think of my generation, those mid-80 guys, because there are a few other guys who were, were hammered out in those days or first, first wave, but we're not. There were guys in Japan who were doing this in the mid to late 70s, and those were first wave guys. Good Shops like Banana Boat or... Fake Alpha, which Berber Virginia now owes. Ted Asada used to be the owner of that. And there are Delaware, a variety of stores, some that still exist, of course, some that don't. Those guys were coming over, buying this stuff, you know, in the 70s. I mean, I, I talked and to Kenji. When, I'm when, sorry. When we, look at, when we look at that time period and those early guys, it's always been the same genres of stuff that they... I mean, the trends will fluctuate within the vintage world, but it's always been the same stuff that they're going after, which is like, like you kind of mentioned before this podcast was the, the Depression era, workwear, uh, Americana cultural, culturally significant stuff. I'm assuming, mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, I, I think that's true, and then there's variations on it. I mean, you know, I talked to, and I, 
I believe I have this correct. So this is for Kenji at Banana Boat. If he sees this and I'm wrong, I'm just wrong. But I believe he told me when he first used to go out to look for old stock, which is what people did, uh, is that he would only buy stuff. He would only buy leather patch double X's. Now, in the mid-70s, you know, they were still making Big E jeans, right? I mean, Big yeah. E's probably, I mean, when I got in the business, they were still making red line jeans. That's when I started it. That's so crazy to think. They were still making them, right? And so, but he would say he would only buy, for instance, leather patch double X's. Now he, if I understood him correctly, there's a disclaimer there, uh, but if I understood him correctly, he left the Lees and the Wranglers and some of all of that stuff. Now, in retrospect, of course, he thinks maybe he shouldn't have done that. Now, Kenji, of course, is is has been a brilliant businessman and still has the same shop that I've known him to have for 30 years. It's meticulous. It's expensive. But I'm fairly sure he has a very well-heeled clientele who respect him. I mean, the thing about the Japanese is sometimes it's not just the piece you buy, but who you buy it from, right? So to buy from Banana Boat, to buy from Kenji, one of the maybe first five guys in the world to discover vintage denim. I mean, that says something about you as a consumer that you have that relationship, that you can buy that from it. Now his price may be significantly more than maybe some other venues, but nonetheless, that kind of relationship. Yeah, it yeah, comes with that esteem. It does. Uh, I think does. any good, successful business should strive to have that esteem within their own market because that is that is the ultimate telltale sign that you've done it right, that people want to do business with you just for the fact of doing business with, right. with you, right? Well, I, think you, I think you see contemporary businesses even take that a step further where they create a lifestyle. I mean, that's where lifestyle businesses has come from is if you go into a double RL, I walk into double RL and I think, yes, this is the life I want to have. I want to live here. I want to wear everything here. <laughs> this, is, this, this is what I want. And they're purposely trying to create that. Right now, double RL particularly resonates with me. But you can walk into certain stores and they're creating an experience for you that makes you think that that $250,000, $500,000, item that you're looking at that they spend $125 on yeah. is something that you need to have for life so you can literally buy into that experience. And, and you will, you will really go, you'll go out of your way to make sure something, to buy something, even if it's not the right fit, it's not perfect for you, but you're like, I just want to be able to have part of what they're selling, you know, that's and that it. experience. That, 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 that's it. That, 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 that there's, a, there's a connection there in consumerism. And, and, and Vinny's clothing is, in my opinion, consumerism. I mean, I, we like to think, and in some ways it is different. I mean, people cherish it, hold it longer. It certainly is not fast fashion and that kind of thing. But there are trends and there are emotions involved and there are other needs involved that sort of drive people to buy certain things or are attracted to certain things. Uh, so, but I, I circling around, I, I, I just say, I, I feel like I was in the right place at the right time. I had sort of an opening in my life to come into the business. And I, I know that your father was in the business. So I know he, you have some perspective on this. Is I'm assuming you have a perspective on this. Is that it was magic. It was like when we used to roll out to the Rose Bowl in the early days, we'd roll out with a 24-foot rider truck. We'd have 10 to 12 racks of stuff that was curated. People would wait 45 minutes in line just to pay us for stuff. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is after this is after they've picked it out. After we negotiate, they had to wait because we had line, and it wasn't just us. I don't mean to imply that we were so heads and heels above other people, but we had a fairly good setup, and we had some pretty great stuff. <laughs> Excuse me, but yeah. that's the world. It was. I mean, there were guys walking around, literally with $100,000 in their pocket to spend that day out there. Throws. I want to get into the Rose Bowl, but I got to rewind just a little bit back yeah, to those early days. So, yeah. well, first of all, tell me, what was the first year you did the Rose Bowl roughly? Can you remember? So the first, first year I did the Rose Bowl, so I found a new old stock store. And I'd heard about the Rose Bowl, 
but I didn't really know anything about it. I found a new old stock store, actually did very well. And it was a, I won't bore you with all the details, but something that a lot of other people had known about. No, we want I, the details. This is the best. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. So it was outside Sacramento and everybody in, there were a handful of dealers in Sacramento, old time dealers doing longer than I was. There was a Japanese guy. Uh, there was another American guy who had been in the game for quite some time at, in that period. And somehow they knew about this store and it wasn't very far outside Sacramento. And I didn't. I mean, I was so busy, like trying to grind out, making some money that I wasn't thinking big. And there were guys out looking for old stores. I didn't have the capital of the time. Yeah. So before that, before uh, you hit, had this store, before you hit this store, your yeah. main source of, of supply was thrifting? Thrifting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, ab- yeah, thrifting. Yeah. So I love that because I, I never even have gone back that far with you in our personal yeah. talks. And oh, yeah. I, in, in, in California, it was already fairly sophisticated. Sacramento is very close to Sac- San Francisco and not too far from LA, which is- Oh, where but, you, but where were you living at the time? Were you in Seattle? Sacramento. Oh, you were living there. Oh, okay. I lived in Sacramento, yeah. Okay. I grew up in Sacramento. And I was hitting the same thrift store three times a day. Oh, wow. And when the new racks would come out, you're always there. Waiting for, waiting for the rack to roll. Waiting for the rack to roll. That was always the deal. Now, mind you, I mean- so this is 1985, 1986, 1987. So World War II was not that long. It was 40 years ago. Now World War II is how many years ago, right? Yeah, it's crazy. And so, it's a, so it's, it was a whole different thing. You could actually find a 1930s or 40s rayon Hawaiian shirt rolling on the rack. Thrift stores then, even the big thrift stores, Goodwill, Salvation Armor, Savers, they would put stuff out that was wrinkled. They would put out stuff that was not quite perfect. My impression now is that thrift stores want to be like Target. They want it to be nice and clean and they won't put stuff out that's damaged or has signs of use. But in those days, that was not the case. But yeah, that's basically how I did the business. So I worked at night. I was the waiter at night and I'd run the thrift stores all day. And that's kind of how I did my thing. And that's how I did it until I found the dead stock store. Once I found the dead stock store, I invested some, you know, a few thousand dollars and made a lot of money. I actually ended up flying to Japan with a list of stuff I had. In fact, I went to Fake Alpha. Ted Hasada was the owner then. And I left this list with him. And he didn't call me. And I had to stay in some crappy hotel because I didn't know where to stay. I just, you know, and so I left this list. With him. So I went in the next day and I said, you didn't call me. And he looked at me and said, I don't think you have this stuff. And I said, Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, mean, I had two, three pages of all this dead stock stuff that I had. Dead stock double X's, dead stock first jackets, dead stock longhorn denim shirts. I mean, I had a ton of stuff. That's awesome. We got to yeah. rewind a minute, though. How did yeah. you get in the store and nobody else got in? So here's the deal. And and I've told this story many times. So if it seems you know, like I've said it before, I have. My wife and my best friends, my wife, we weren't married at the time, wanted to go on vacation. I didn't want to go on vacation. I liked to work. I was out jumping all the time. I had the bug. I wanted to do it. They want to go to vacation to Santa Cruz. So to appease me, like I'm literally sitting in the back seat pouting because we're going on vacation to Santa Cruz. Where's the thrift stores? <laughs> right, exactly. So they decide, let's take the river roads. Just to appease me, we'll take the river roads, we'll stop at small towns, we'll look at stuff. So we stopped at a small town, hour or two outside of Sacramento, along the Sacramento River Road. And this guy actually had some dead stock red lines, but they were big size. I was new enough in the business where I still thought that was quite a score. Turned out they were impossible to sell, but nonetheless, they were, they, they were, it was red line. I mean, it's, it had the stuff and, you know, I'm about and I asked him if there were any other stores. And he said, well, there's a store over in this next town. And the couple's a very old couple. They still have all their inventory. They shut, they shut the store in the 60s because both their children died in a car accident on the River Road at the same time. So they shut the store, but they still have all the same merchandise. And once or twice a year, they'll flip the, the sign around it says open people come in and buy stuff and then they close for another year or so 
So we went and looked at this store. And now, mind you, this is an old dry goods store. So you can't see in there. I'm looking through windows. And as best I can tell, way back against the far wall are some dead stock slim fits. Not PKs, but slim fits. And at the time, you know, it was probably worth between 50 and 125, which was a lot of money in the 80s, by the way. Oh, yeah. I could see they were back there, but I couldn't see anything else. I mean, really, you couldn't. And so I poked around the store and just asked people about this place because it wasn't open and there was nobody there. And I ended up getting the name of who owned it. Ended up getting their phone number because the people that owned the dry cleaners were cousins and they kind of explained the emotional lay of the land to these people. So, and this has not always been the case for me, but I was shrewd enough at the moment to think, you know what? I'm not calling them right now. I just don't feel like my mind's right. I'm going to wait. So we went on vacation, came back a week later, same through, through the same town, looked in the window some more, and still didn't call. Went back to Sacramento, then drove back to the town about a week later when I sort of felt like I had my head on straight. Because I thought, at this point, I figured I had one phone call. It, I had one opportunity to get in. If I said the wrong thing, had the wrong tone of voice, whatever, if they were just not in the right mood, it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I, I know exactly that feeling, Larry. And it, you uh, do, you get one shot and there's been times you got to walk that walk lightly. You got to be pushy enough to make it happen, but you don't want to make them never talk to you again. It's yeah. really this tricky dance. Right. Right, right. It's almost like any transaction, you know, when we do face-to-face -face business, it's the same thing. You've got a $20,000 piece, you got to, the deal needs to be done then. You try and get a guy back in the room on a $20,000 piece, it's not the same thing. And that's the same thing with this, is, you know, you, I felt like I had one shot. So we, a friend of mine, we drove back to the town. I actually didn't have much money on me because I had a shipment of used 501s in London which they hadn't paid for. And so all my money was already tied up and I didn't have a lot of cash on me. So we're, I'm dialing this number, we're in the town, small town, and I'm dialing the number and literally my friend and I are talking about what we're gonna do for lunch when they say no, <laughs> right? Like, well, what do you wanna do after they tell us they can't come in? So the woman picks up and I give her the spiel. I said, look, you know, I buy old clothes. I see you guys got stuff. Uh, I said, I'd be willing to come in and pay you just to look at stuff if I had to. I'll buy everything if you like. I can pick if you like. I'd just like to see what you had. And literally, she said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in town. She said, I'll meet you there in 10 minutes. Uh, and I hung up the phone, and my friend and I looked at each other like, what? Is this really going to happen? So we got into the store, and I got to the Slim Fits. And they had in screw and light bulbs, and that's how old the store was, just a handful of screw and light bulbs around. So it was really dim in there and dingy and dusty and dirty. And it was all dry goods store, so like there were hair nets and you know, junk like that. And so after I get over the momentary hit of seeing the slim fits, I said to her, Did you guys ever sell 501s? And she says, Yeah. And she goes over to this table, which I hadn't seen throws back this tarp, this dirty old tarp, and it's stacked high with all dead stock 501s. And wow. I pick it up because they closed the store in the 60s. There were no single stitches. It was all double X's and big E's. And I don't remember exactly how many pieces. It wasn't like hundreds and hundreds, but there were a lot, certainly around 100 pieces, I recall. And... I wasn't quite sure what the fair thing to do was. At some point I realized that she thought she was taking advantage of me. So I just let her call the prices. And I said, she said how much they were. And I said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take this whole table. Well, I didn't have the money to pay for it. So <clears throat> what we realized was is every time we counted something with this couple because they were older and they were nervous is they thought we were short counting. So we had to be very slow and very methodical and very careful and made sure that they were clear about what we were doing and stuff like that. So we realized, my friend and I, that we couldn't leave the store at the same time. If we both left, 
You but weren't coming back. More money, she wouldn't let us back in. So <laughs> they obviously had original price tags on them. Original price tags. Do you yeah. remember what the I price have tags? No, I, I have no idea. Like but even roughly what the prices were? No. I, I, I got to say they had to be, they were somewhere between 6 and $12 is what I'm going to guess. Because in those days, Levi's were retailing contemporary for around $21. $21, $22 for shrink to fit Levi's. Yeah. So okay. they were considerably cheaper, but she was charging me what contemporary prices were is what she wanted for them. Okay. And so what happened was is that, of course, like any dealer, I'm over it in a minute, like, okay, where's the rest? And so I said the same thing. Did you guys sell jackets? And I kid you not, right next to it is another, another table with a dirty tarp on it, and she throws it back and it's stacked high with jackets. Now, they didn't have number two jackets. They had some dead stock first edition jackets and Big E jackets and then Wrangler and stuff. And it was funny because they didn't have Wrangler jeans. They had Wrangler jackets, had some other Bluebell products. But essentially, that's how this whole experience went. Is it was Not only was it sort of a discovery because you're in some place that has, it's like a museum that you can shop at, but there were all these dynamics going on and we're looking under counters and we're looking behind counters because as I said, we realized at this point, they'll never let us back in here and we weren't going to miss a trick. I mean, we were in, we had to be careful. We had to be polite, which, which of course I would have been anyway, but we had to be cognitive of their emotional response, not just the business part of it, but kind of how were they perceiving how we were behaving versus what we thought we were doing. So we couldn't move too quick. It wasn't like we were running around in there, right? Because we didn't want to scare them and, and, and make this more uncomfortable than it already was. But that was that was what sort of changed. And I think most guys in the business have an experience like that, where you go between from being a picker to where you can hold your product and then sell it to people for the prices you want instead of what you have to sell it for because you need the money. But to do that, you have to have a certain amount of capital. You, if you're going to pass on, in those days, if I was going to pass on a two or $3,000 deal for my load, I had to have money to back myself up for the next couple of months because how many guys were going to be coming through? Because this is fairly early, and there weren't a lot of guys coming to the States at those times. So to have that money buffer gave me the ability to grow as a dealer and to become more professional. I, I think as a dealer, yeah. instead of needing to sell, I could choose to sell. And in, in, like you said, in the early days, there's no cell phones. Even when I started in this business, it was probably the early days of me having a cell phone. I was a late adopter anyway, but, yeah. and how, before you decided to get on a plane and go to Japan, how are you creating your business connections in those early days? How are you meeting so, people? Well, you know, generally speaking, like, you know, one guy, the guy who swore me to secrecy on vintage denim is a guy who saw me picking stuff in a thrift store. He saw me coming out with a load of five or ones and said, dude, well, <laughs> this is actually before dude. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, uh, I, I'm buying you usually, but he said, yeah, do you know about other stuff? And I said, no. And he said, well, I could, he said, literally he said, look, I'll teach you stuff, but you have to sell to me. And I said, Cool. And it turned out the guy was half crook. And within a period, a handful of months that I did business with him, I had found a pair of Lee Cowboy Bucklebacks hair on hide patch. Found them in Stockton, California, five in the afternoon, which if you drive from Sacramento, it's like an hour or some drive. So if you went to Stockton, that was your day. And so yeah. like, it's the end of my day. I'm not finding much. I find a pair of Buckleback hair on hide Lee Cowboy which I barely knew what they were. And they were big at the time. I think they measured a 38 waist, which was considered very big at the time for the market. And uh, I sold them to him for $150, which I thought, by the, by the way, $150 at the time was a huge amount of money, huge amount of money. I mean, relatively speaking. He at the time, so I've heard later, sold them for 3000 So at some point... What happened in our, our relationship is I would end up having all my rent money tied up in my product and he was supposed to be there to buy it and he wouldn't show up. Uh, and, and I, you, know, you didn't have a lot of options in those days. I might know one other guy and 
I'd lose money if I sold to him, but I had to sell to somebody. So ultimately, I ended up stopped doing business with this guy, basically because he was unreliable and I couldn't afford unreliable. And I ended up hearing about a couple of shops in Japan, flew to Japan and kind of figured it out, you know, kind of figured out. Now, the funny thing was, is I ended up going to, once again, the Banana Boat and Fake Off and some of these, you know, iconic stores. Well, it was fairly close to the Rose Bowl, which I hadn't been to yet. And these, all these guys were in the United States and <laughs> going to go to the Rose Bowl. So I'd flown to Japan to meet these guys, and they were all in the United States, except for Ted Hassan. And so the story with Ted is, is that he ended up buying that load from me. And, he, you know, he, once he figured out I had the stuff I had, because I had some samples, he um, said, well, let's go to lunch. And he gave the list I had of the stuff I had to his manager. Manager went gone for about a half an hour. Ted's being somewhat Japanese, since somewhat aloof and kind of, not quite condescending, but kind of, you know, you know, Shogun-like. Well, basically, like <laughs> you, you had said, he, you walked in with this list the day before. He didn't even believe you. You're, you're right. in your 20s, uh, yeah. traveled halfway, well, the, the whole way across the world with this yeah. list that could be complete bullshit or not. And yeah. he was probably yeah. just so shocked at the time and yeah. disbelief, so, I can imagine. Yeah, so what he did is the, the guy came back and they made me an offer. And the offer was absurdly low. And and I know we've all experienced this. That he assured me at the time that based on the retail prices, it was absolutely the best they could do and implied that they were being generous. And, and I said, you know what, man, I appreciate your time, but we're not close enough for us to work this out. And I, you know, I had very little negotiating experience under me, but that's how far we were apart where I was going to walk on the deal. Well, as you might imagine, he wouldn't let me get up from the table. <laughs> and, uh, he came, he doubled, he essentially doubled his offer to buy the load. And, and I sold the load to him. Now he had to come to the United States and all that stuff and do all that stuff. But it was, a, in some ways, for me, it was really magical. Is not too strong a word. It was so exciting. I mean, going to Japan, I mean... You know, I I I really had never really flown before then. I mean, I was I was flying to Japan. I literally was sweating. I mean, I was dripping sweat by the time I got to Japan. I was so terrified of flying. It was just for my life and for me at the time, it was an amazing experience. And I don't I you know I I look at the market now. I think some degree we're gonna get to where, where are things now and how do I relate to that? And it's it's different, but it's the same. I look at these young guys, and I mean, they know Disney tees, or you know, first it was rock tees, and then it was sort of some of these other new new one guard kind of tees. And now we're talking about Disney tees and all these things, things that I literally, and no offense to anyone, have no interest whatsoever in. I mean, at all. So, but I what I what I see about it is the excitement and the passion and the thrill that people have still from doing the business. It's different in so many ways from when I first started, but to some degree, it's the same experience. A lot of times guys attracted to our business and guys who have opening in their lives, either time-wise or they have a need to make money. And this becomes amazing to them amazing to them i mean it's way different than when i the information is so available now guys treat each yeah. other I mean, when i was in the game you know when we when i used to run the thrift stores there was animosity i mean you were you know you'd stand in front of a rack and you would plant your feet in a certain way that if somebody comes slugs you in the back of the head that <laughs> you wouldn't get knocked over i mean it was very very competitive and I know at least a lot of young guys here from Seattle, you know, at least as of 10 years ago when I knew these guys a little better, they had a much more cooperative sort of understanding way of working with, with each other. Now, I'm sure one guy might buy something and make a lot of money off his friend. I mean, that stuff happens. But it's a, it is a different dynamic in that sense. But in terms of people making money, people's lives being changed, and it being just kind of fun... I see that happening to other people with the stuff they're doing, and I'm, and I'm glad to see it. 
It's not something that's not a part of the business. I mean, I've stopped. My learning curve is done. I've sort of settled on the things that I like, settled how I do things, and this is going to be how I do them for the older good of it. Yeah. But the younger guys doing it now, they're doing things different. They're doing it in different ways. They're sharp and smart as hell. And I, it, it's exciting to see. I mean, I, I'm glad I you mentioned really that. Really and and uh, you're right. There are certain similarities that will never change, certain things in the business, the sense of freedom, the sense of adventure in a way of like, you know, you're out there doing what you want to do and you're a modern day Indiana Jones and yeah. and the, the picker's high. Like you, that that will remain the same. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the worst time to try and buy something from somebody after they just found it. It's almost like, you know, a wild animal with a kill in their mouth. They've got the taste of the blood and they're shaking it. And it's like, don't try and buy it now. Try wait to try this. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait a week until they calm down. Uh, then maybe you got some eggs. That's so true. That is so true. And that it's different for everybody because there's some people, and I've talked about this before, but at the Rose Bowl, you'll see the same thing in their booth. And it'll be the same price for like eight months in a row, 10 months, maybe even a couple of years. And then yeah. there's some dealers like myself where like, oh, that's been here for three months. I'm ready to move that like for whatever, yeah. you know, and it comes down. But yes, it always starts up at that initial <laughs> yeah. initial price, right? Because yeah. you're the most attached to it. And yeah. Yeah, I think I think one of the ways that you can, you know, one of the ways that, you know, people read people in the business is you can tell if somebody doesn't know what they're doing by, you know, initial negotiations. Either they ask, they ask way too little for it or they ask way too much. In either case, you know they don't know what they have because they're too far apart on it. And that gives you to some degree, that gives you information in terms of negotiating. Now, the dilemma is, as I've always found, is if you go into somebody's asking two thousand for a piece that's worth seven hundred, and you tell them that they're not selling it to you. The second guy who comes in and says, "No, that's worth seven hundred," that's the guy they're selling it to, right? Because <laughs> you know you've already burst their bubble. They think you suck, but well, okay, here you go. Now they're going to sell it to the second guy guy in the room. So it's oh, always it's, there's always an interesting interesting amount of dynamics to go. So uh, now that you've done uh, this dead stock dig in the timeline, you've you've had your big score. You've gone to Japan. You've created some relationships with some of these right. some of these Japanese buyers. Obviously, like you've kind of said, that's a, that was a turning point for you in the business where you now had stock, or I guess you sold it all. That first load, you sold all one hundred percent. I think I kept you know I kept some stuff, but prim- primarily, yeah, I, I sold it. I sold it all. Yeah, but that gave you kind of seed money to then. Yeah, it gave me the, it gave me not only it, in some sense it gave me some experience and some sense of confidence and some sense of momentum which was was important but in that same period also within a handful of months I moved to Seattle and Seattle at that time was completely different than California there were stores here but there was like a young woman who used to go out for one of the buyers here who was actually a big buyer but she would only go out maybe twice a week or twice, excuse me, once every two weeks to buy Levi's off the rack because there was no competition. When I first moved here, I was going into these thrift stores and I could literally find within a day like a hundred pair of Levi's. Wow. In Sacramento, if I found 10 pairs of Levi's in a day, that was a big day. And I literally told my wife, I think somebody's on vacation. And when they get back, they're going to be really pissed because we're buying all the Levi's. But in reality, what was going on is there just wasn't that kind of competition here. You could still go into vintage stores here in Seattle and find vintage denim just on the rack, not even like on the wall, which in California, you already had, you know, the, uh, the big stores in Los Angeles and big stores in San Francisco. I mean, it was already to some degree at that point became a thing that people knew about. Do you think that was because in, in LA, Sacramento, maybe New York, it was, it's because they're bigger fashion centers or it's just because... No, I think it really had because they had the Japanese there. You had people who were more networked and the more networked people became. And that, that, that's sort of, you know, once again, for my generation, and, and I think for you guys too, is it became very, the smartest thing I did when I first came here, and it was on the same business model I said about making a quarter on a piece, is I networked. I met guys who I saw as I knew were picking, 
who were like local pickers, but weren't quite to the hip to the jean thing. And at that time, I think I was selling jeans for like $12. I would pay them $10. We're like, you know, other local people would want to be paid nothing, or they have this one woman that go out who would buy it and whatever. Yeah. So I fairly quickly networked. And that's something that paid off me because once again, this is before information was out there. And I knew more than either people knew at the time or the other people who knew were willing to tell. I mean, I, and, and, and once again, it's not a value judgment. I'm not being critical of these people who didn't tell people they were buying a big E from them and say it was worth X amount of dollars. But for my temperament, and I also, I think just pragmatically, it made more sense to me to tell somebody, that's a big E jacket. I can pay you $50 for that instead of 10, like a regular one, because that's worth more. And that's, that helped me network and sort of spread out here. That having the nest egg or the money that I had set aside from what I sold, but also having some sense of you know, creating relationships with people. Yeah. And, that, and uh, that's on the buying side. And right. then again, being fair on the buying side and accumulating more at a less margin, you're able to then be the guy that everybody knows will have what they need when they need it. Correct. Right. Right, right. So you we, become the go-to. We, you know, we certainly, it, it, at some point, we started off, initially I started off in the back of our apartment. There were these old wooden garages, like people literally would have parked their Model Ts in. We started off with one garage. Before I opened my first showroom, we had five garages. And so we had gone one, two, three, you know, this would be denim, this would be T-shirts, this would be vintage. I mean, that, that kind of thing. So, we, you know, I, the good thing was is we started off small and took things slowly. We didn't quickly open up a showroom, and that, that wouldn't have made any sense. That was not anything that I would have understood at the time. But we, yeah. grew, we grew, and I was somewhat cautious with our money. The only way I spent our money was not on personal luxury things, but was on business. I mean, I'd take tons of risk on business. My wife and I went looking for a couch at one point, and the couch was, and this was in the 80s, the couch was $2,000. I looked and I said, what the hell, a couch for $2,000? And she looked at me and she said, are you out of your mind? You have pants that are $2,000. And you don't, this doesn't make sense. I said, yeah, I get the pants, but I, I don't understand the couch. But in those days, that's sort of where, you know, all my mind was involved in the business. That's all that really made sense to me. And of course, in those days, it, it, you know, if, you, if I told somebody what I did for a living, they were like, you mean you sell poodle skirts or tuxedos? Oh, or what is? I, know, I can relate to that even from when I yeah. started. So I can imagine in the 80s, people had no clue. There was no... There was no general esteem to buying secondhand, and it was looked down oh, upon no. until pretty much oh, yeah. recently. Yeah, yeah, I think, I yeah, I, I think that's I think that's true. I mean, I I remember telling somebody I was in wearing a 1950s Gab jacket, and, and for the kind of jacket that was, it was a smashing get jacket. And I I told some dude because I was at a club. I said, yeah, I got this at the first store for five dollars, and he said, yeah, it's still cool. And it's like, no, wait a minute. That's the good part. The good part is I got it for five dollars. That's not the downside. The downside is, it's a, you know, there is no downside. It's a great jacket, and I got it for five dollars. You're exactly right. Nobody in the United States really at that time really got Americana. I mean, we'd come out of the '70s with the anti-war, anti-American sort of sentiment, and once again, no value judgment on that. But just in terms of the temperaments. And then we've gone into disco, which is so far away from quality clothing, you know, that you can be. And then went into people collecting the Japanese. I mean, essentially, the Japanese created this market. The Japanese discovered American vintage clothing and taught us about it. I mean, that's a, that essentially what happened. And in those days, the great thing was, is all you had to do was have it. It was sold before you bought it, how much it was sold for and who. That's all up for grabs, but it was sold. Yeah, I love, that. I love it. that. And I've never heard it talked about in relation to the disco and, and the synthetics. And I guess, so what you, what you said before is that, that period was when they created all these synthetic fabrics or at least brought it to the main mass market, right? Yeah. yeah. And before, like, you know, it's cottons, it's wools, it's the natural fibers. 
Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, for me, and, and that, that still is something that, that I value about vintage clothing, which is to some degree where I cannot quite buy into, at least on, on for myself, onto the contemporary market, is that, you know, it, that's not as important any longer. You, you certainly blend T-shirts are perfectly fine, for instance, where I still think, oh, no, it has to be 100% cotton. It's not true for the market, and it's not true for certain collectors, mm-hmm. And it's not where the emphasis of the market is. That was one of the things that attracted me. And a lot of people at the time was because, you know, coming out of, once again, the hippie times were natural and versus synthetic or unnatural. There was a certain amount of movement that, that, you know, I grew up through that period and came into the business sort of feeling like, yeah, I like cotton. I like wool. I like, like that kind of stuff. Whereas, I, you know, polyester and that was absurd. So we've talked about denim, of course, that is, I've always said this too, that's where the, the business started. The business started with, with Levi's and then the vintage workwear within Americana. But right. in those early days of you picking, what were other categories and other items that you were buying? Well, once again, I mean, at, at the time, it, it, was, it was like all the stars had lined up and virtually anything, I mean, there were just, so there was... 50s rock, what's considered rockabilly now, which was 50s gabardine kind of clothing, Hawaiian shirts. Pretty soon Nike became a market. Patagonia became a market. Stussy and skater stuff became a market. At one point, all those things were popular at the same time. So you could be selling 1930s, 40s Levi's and 1980s Nikes. I mean, those could be in your booth at the same t- same time, right? Yeah. That was, and the, and there was a huge demand for all of it. I mean, I, I literally had, you know, several hundred Nikes at the Rose Bowl and dead stock '30s tennis shoes, you know, brown on brown, at, 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 you know, at the same time. And so it was fairly quickly that market exploded. And once again, it was like it was like magic. It was just like being someplace where something so fun was happening. It was so dynamic. It was so exciting. I mean, you know, at the Rose Bowl in those days, people would, I mean, guys would show up from Kansas or Mississippi or whatever, and they'd be thrown on the ground, dead stock. I mean, you, you roll up on some guy, it's still dark, you got your flashlight, and he's got 20 pairs of dead stock pants there. And... Yeah, I mean, these are just, Rose Bowl used to be the first showing for everything, once again, before the internet. So if you wanted to be in this game, this is where everything went. It went so, to the Rose Bowl. Do you remember the year or roughly the year you started going? About, about 89. About 89. 89. And do you know how many years before you went was the Rose Bowl known for vintage? So... Well, a handful of years, and I don't know when the Rose Bowl first started that way, but I can assure you by when I first when I first went, it was already established there. I, I was shocked. For one thing, I was surprised it wasn't in, on the field. For some reason, when I envisioned the Rose Bowl, I thought it was going to be in the stadium. Inside, yeah. Wow, that, how interesting. I thought, and I envisioned what this might look like. Well, as you know, it's not. It's in the parking lot. And yeah. so, and and so that was sort of an interesting thing. But it was, it was dynamic. My wife, at one point, within a couple of months of us going there, she was wearing a, a Levi's second edition jacket, which once again is a, a very popular item. But for a handful of years, had not been very popular recently. But literally, guys were chasing her down the aisle trying to buy it off her back. I mean, it was just, it was just unbelievable. It was just. It yeah. was just unbelievable. The, and did you go the first one and sell, or did you go just to observe? So, no, I, I did go the first one and sell, but I sold out of the parking lot and got caught. <laughs> Ooh, Larry, <laughs> bad boy. <laughs> yeah, because I, I didn't know any, I didn't know how I didn't know how to get a ticket. I didn't know, you know. And in fact, my friend and I had driven all night with this load of stuff because we knew that the Rose Bowl opened it. I think it was six o'clock is what we'd heard or something like that. And we'd driven all night. Well, we got there, we got to Pasadena at like three or four in the morning from Sacramento. It was too early to go to the Rose Bowl. So we ended up stopping at a hotel, which you probably have not seen. I think it's off I-5. And it was called the Rose Bowl Hotel. And I thought, great, we'll stay at the Rose Bowl Hotel. 
Well, it turns out the Rose Bowl Hotel was a prostitute crack hotel, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> but it's four in the morning. We've been driving all night. And I said, we don't know where to go. We're just completely like, we don't know where anything is. We don't even know where Rose Bowl is, in fact. And so we stay in this hotel that night. And literally, there were drugs in the room that we stayed in. We didn't take them, but they were in the room. So, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, just, once again, such an amazing experience. And just everything was new. Everything was sort of outside, at least my anything that I could have imagined to experience at the time. And you're rolling up to the Rose Bowl and going in there and seeing guys having product that I was sort of becoming aware of and understanding the value of seeing other dudes doing it and seeing professionals out there and then seeing the Japanese so hungry, literally just hungry for the product was just like, wow. Where am I? What is going on here? And I'd already had some experience with selling and buying stuff, but it was nothing like the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl at that time was just, once again, I, it's, a, it's a silly word in some ways, but it really was a magical experience. It was just just so much fun. Now, it was competitive. You had to be on your game. I mean, I, at one point, I rolled up into a booth a year or two. I'm going to the Rose Bowl, and I came into the booth. It was still dark, and there's a rack literally a round rack full of dead stock sweatshirts with variations of color of pink and black. <laughs> and wow. so double V's. Wow. Double V, dead stock, pink and black sweatshirts. I don't think v. I've ever seen one of those. Yes. There was a whole rack. And so I roll up to the booth and it's just about five, three, six. So it's not quite light yet, but getting close to me. And I literally stood there for a second and thought like, are these bootlegs are these fake what's going on and in the time it took for me to try and figure out why this stuff is still on the rack hands are hitting the rack <laughs> and guys are grabbing stuff and i of course grabbed my issue but within that 10 20 30 seconds of me trying to figure out like why is this stuff here it wasn't <laughs> that's just that's just how it was you know it was, just, was it? it was competitive for me going the first i went i think twice before we me and jesse sold there i remember being yeah. very overwhelmed because all the stuff that you spend all your time looking for in the regular day-to-day -day business like you're out there digging you're at thrift stores you'll find a piece here a piece there all of a sudden you're there at the rose bowl and it's all around you, right? right. And it's so right. much of it that right. it kind of like it takes you a minute to get your <laughs> yeah. bless you. It takes Thank you a few takes you a bit to get your mind right about how to process all of it yeah. and how to like what should I be going for? What should I yeah. buy? Yeah, and it's just it, kind of uh, shakes your, it shakes your confidence a little because you're thinking, well, I've got twenty five on that. That guy's got 35 and that guy's got 15. So where where am I at in this 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 thing? Yeah. yeah. And uh yeah, the first time for us selling there, uh, Jesse wasn't actually there. I went with my dad. He came and helped. And I I'm pretty sure we sold to you. I met Mike um that first one. Mm -hmm. And I sold I sold uh, I sold all the dealer stuff that time because we weren't so probably far off on our prices of I mean like underpricing a lot of things and maybe overpricing some things, but we just didn't know the market that well because it was our first sure. kick at the bucket for the Rose Bowl. And, yeah. Um, yeah. but it, I did meet a lot of the original crew from that, from at least the original crew, what I look at it as when I started the Rose Bowl, which was yeah. 2006. And yeah. you were not selling there at that point. You were, you were done by that point selling there. Right. Mike was selling there, which and I wanted to ask, like, you and Mike worked together, correct? For No, no. Mike and I were friends, and we were close in age, and we had, you know, obviously the same interests. But often we were competitors, which would, as you know, can create friction in relationships yep. in this business. Uh, but we, we had a liking for each other. And I like Mike. Mike was, uh, as you know, Mike's passed away. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm very, was very sad to hear that. Yeah. RIP, Mike. Yeah, and uh, but he he had a personality, and Mike had his Mike was Mike, and there's no there were no two Mikes, and he was very good. He had an excellent eye. Uh, he tended to be expensive, but you, you were telling the story about you know somebody walking away from a booth. I, mean, I was in Mike's booth. Somebody made an offer. He had 
five or six Hawaiians, and the guy made him an offer. My, Mike had said some number. The guy came back with about a 15% less offer, and Mike walked him. I said, Mike, what are you doing, man? That dude was in 15% of what you're asking. Why not just let it go? He said, oh, no, 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 no. no I, that's my price. That's my price. And I'm thinking, what an idiot. So I was hanging out in his booth. 20 minutes later, the guy came back and bought it at his price. So that made, reminded me how much I knew about the business. <laughs> because, you know, Mike would certainly set his price, but Mike had great, great stuff. And he had a different approach to how he sold things. But more than once, he proved me wrong that uh, how much you might be able to get out of peace and how maybe sticking on a price might be the way to do things. So Yeah, I, um, I can remember meeting him that first. I, I, I met a lot of people that first Rose Bowl, but meeting him and the transactions that we made stick out in my memory from that first Rose Bowl. Yeah. Probably because of his character. He's such a funny guy and he's kind of uh, out there and wild and... Um, I remember we, I sold him a leather, like a three-quarter length, a single-breasted, probably 30s wool-lined leather jacket. He bought a, a, a U.S. Army, like, 40s T-shirt off me. And I, I don't remember, like, it's hard to remember all these things you have throughout your years, yeah. you know, and what you sell. Yeah. But I distinctly remember our transaction from that first Rose Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, there was, that was still, that, that period was still very active. Very, very active. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going down. I mean, I, I go to the Rose Bowl now, and I, I know you guys set up at the Rose Bowl, but I, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot of people like I used to. A lot of guys that, you know, from my era are, are not doing the game anymore. They're doing yeah. it different. And it's a different experience out there now. And, it, and I don't think it's the first showing anymore. I mean, the Japanese network with most of the, the dealers, I know you guys got very loyal customers. And so you don't need to show up there. You've got people who you can see. Yeah. And so it be it is now where rules, well, generally speaking, is not the first showing for things. And that sort of is a was a, is a disappointment. I mean, for you know to go there because it used to be, like I said, it used to be that was the first showing, and you would just see amazing stuff. Not that it wasn't competitive. Not that it wasn't stressful because it was, but. It's, it was kind of like being in Candyland. I mean, just, you know. Yeah. And there's so something about that around. first showing that's so important because like you said, after somebody like that, when you first see something or when somebody first finds something, and I would imagine back in those early days when the business is still in development stages, I, I want to use that term, right. but, you know, it's like people are still figuring out what is cool and what's what. There's no documentation on... Right. what vintage is. It's just right. all in the heads of the dealers and the Japanese dealers, yeah. because that's how it got, that's how it was developed. And then you're going to be seeing things that you didn't even know existed or yeah. s- some version of something or something yeah. that's so rare that you're like, I didn't even know. And yeah. that's yeah. been wild. Yeah. I think that's, you know, it's interesting because you know I talk to people about Instagram, which has become a, a huge part of the market now. And I think in fact, it's, almost becoming such a stable part of the market, it may not be as cutting edge as it once was. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if you look at, you know, Instagram, you see tons of people's collections. You'll see pieces, you know, first edition jackets, World War II jackets, older jackets. I mean, you see all this stuff out there, and it somehow gives an impression that this stuff is still available out there. And it is not. It's not that you can't find stuff from the 40s or the 30s, because you can, and people do all the time. But it's not out there in the sense of, like, turning on your computer or going on your phone and looking at Instagram, looking, oh, there's just all this stuff. It's everywhere. Everybody's got all this stuff. And it sort of skews people's understanding of what's rare and what isn't rare and what it might be worth or might not be worth. It's an interesting sort of thing where, like you said, early in the, in the game, people are still discovering pieces. You're just, you're trying to link, well, what's this piece here versus this piece here? What, how do these relate? What, which came first and what's the distinction? Does it, does that extra buttonhole here, does that mean something? Or is that, you know, all that kind of stuff you had to figure it out. And yeah. the guys that knew weren't gonna tell you. It wasn't like, you know, the guys, you know, guys, if you're going to sell it to somebody and they knew more than you did, it wasn't like they said, oh, by the way, 
you don't realize that's 1920s, not 1940s, that's worth a lot more than you're selling it for. That, those conversations didn't happen. So you always had to go out there and the way you learn things is by selling something and losing money or making money. That's how you learn. That's yeah. Just, and you can't, you can't be upset about that because that's, it's part of the education. And I think it, 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 it's a rite of passage. It Everyone's is. done it. You've done it. I've yeah. done it. Yeah. Everyone does it. It's, 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 it's it's and how the game works. That's it blows true. my mind to think about, like you said, you know, a buttonhole or a stitch detail or no. different things on these garments, right? Now, the only documentation that there would have been about any of this is the original documentation, which was from the time periods these garments were produced, if you could even access any of that, correct? Right, right. Because once again, there was no eBay. You couldn't do search workwear catalog that, that that was not something that could be done you could either go to a trade show i mean not a trade show, you go to an antique show and go through the paper guy stuff and see if you can find the catalog uh, but you know generally speaking what would happen at least in my experience the way the way i learned is i'd buy a piece and think huh i never saw that before and then i'd have to think about it you think well i saw this and i saw that now I'm seeing this, so what is it? You just have to sort of think your way through it, you know, which, you know, often if you sell a piece too quick, then you don't get that, get to do that process sometimes. Yeah. But if you hold on to a piece and you're able to contemplate and sort of look at it and put two and two together, it's kind of how those, how those things came together. But gen generally speaking, you know, it, and, and also markets were emerging. It, it, so workwear really wasn't, part of the original denim movement. It is that the guys didn't buy workwear, but they didn't really get it. It wasn't like everybody knew Levi's and workwear denim. Those were not synonymous. Those were different things. I mean, I actually went to a clothing show in Santa Monica, and I remember telling a woman the stuff she had was too old and wasn't interesting for the market <laughs> because it was old Lee stuff, and what was popular at the time was 50s gabardine and 50s denim and all that stuff. And the stuff she had was 20s. And so wow. at that time... At so did you, you, you passed on this stuff because I of that? I passed on some of it. I passed on some of it. Yeah, I passed on some of it. And that kind of is interesting too. You look at Levi's jackets. And oftentimes the second edition is more sought after at certain times than the first edition, even though the age is. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, I think it, it really depends on on the trends. But I did not know that fact about the denim. So when you when you say denim and workwear are separate, yeah. denim be, meaning like like jeans and like western, say western. 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 So okay, yeah, yeah. western yeah. denim and workwear. Now, it, it isn't it isn't that there weren't some shops that had some understanding of workwear in Japan, but in terms of it being a market, an understood market as much as Levi's was at the time, it wasn't. It, it, it wasn't. And, you know, Levi's is, you know, even the, the discovering of all the things that are common knowledge about Levi's now, we're still being discovered. I mean, a 213 jacket versus a 506 jacket, you know, all those kinds of things is, you know, you, you might have heard of one, but until you handle a piece, you didn't really know what the difference between one piece and another. There weren't like the photographs. On. Though also, there were magazines early in the days. There was a magazine called Fine Boy which was, you know, kind of before Boone. Boone is one of the magazines that in the 80s and 90s, the magazines tend to run like in a 10-year stint, you know, where this magazine is a dominant magazine of all the three or four vintage magazines dedicated to vintage in the market at the time. And Boone turned out to be probably the biggest for its period and for a long time. But before Boone, there were other ones. There was Fine Boy, there was Pop Popeye, and still some stuff came out. But getting access to a magazine from Japan was like, where were you going to get that? It wasn't like there were, you know, in Japanese stores here, for instance. So yeah. even though there was some information out primarily for the Japanese in terms of the market and the dealers there, there's virtually nothing here in the United States. And so mostly people learn, just like I said, you'd buy a piece. You know, some, some dealer would tell me, I'm looking for this, and I'd go out and buy it, and I'd buy the wrong piece. Well, if I spent $100 on it and it was the wrong piece, I learned. 
I learned <laughs> that was not the piece they were looking for. And so it was a, certainly that kind of hard, hard knocks. But once again, exciting because some because stuff was still out there to be found. It wasn't yeah. like you'd roll around all day and not find anything. You'd find something. Yeah. And so I have a question about Browns Beach, okay? Browns Beach yeah. is popular. It's been popular the whole time I've been in this business. But I look at that as something that is so easily passed because it's very plain looking workwear jacket. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have an insanely distinct like detailing to it that might draw your attention. Mm-hmm. Was that garment always popular in the business? No, no in fact, it, it wasn't. I mean, we used to sell buckle back Brown's Beast vests at the Rose Bowl for $50 with the buckle back. So 30s, 20s version of the of the yeah. for, for 50 hours. And part of that is, is because you're talking about an East Coast, West Coast phenomenon. Brown's Beach was East Coast. A lot of stuff is East Coast versus, I mean, you, you, on the East Coast, you have a lot more sort of woolen mills. You had champion, the different climate in terms of what people, what, you know, why people would wear certain things or different climate. It's just certain, a lot more factories back there. West Coast had more denim. And certainly sort of kind of more kind of semi-Western wear. In the middle, you kind of got the difference, right? I mean, Kansas or, you know, some other place. I mean, Texas, not so much Levi's in Texas, even though there was some Levi's or Kansas might have some similar work wear. At one point early in my career, I went looking for old stock in the South. and went to Mississippi and Louisiana and stuff like that. And fairly quickly realized that if you went to some of these small towns, they didn't carry major brands. They carried local local brands or regional brands, brands that you may never heard of, and usually not great quality. But I got into old department stores in those, you know, from back then. I'd talk my way into some clothes and department store and be surprised that there was no brand there that I recognized because, you know, the South at that time, you know, 30s, 40s, and 50s, was not, for the most part, well-to-do. And, so and when you brands were popular nowadays, if you find an old pair of forties denim or an old workwear jacket from the thirties or forties, it doesn't matter what brand it is. There's value in it to some degree. But in those early days, like you're saying, that stuff didn't really hold the value at all, or wasn't worth worth buying. No, I think that was still in the discovery days. Yeah. But no, yes, you're you're. you're you're right that still if I'd found if I versus Levi's versus Madewell, I'd rather have Levi's. I mean yeah. that that kind of thing. But uh, there were, you know, there were still like, you know, there was some headlight in those areas. But once again, there was at that time when I was there, work where once again was not as uh is not as popular as it became and it is now and sort of we see almost an aftermarket of the workwear market at this point because there's some stuff that's sort of good and not, you know, I mean, all these things go through trends where something gets popular, workwear gets popular, and anything that looks like it is popular. And then you get a, a maturation where certainly people become, well, okay, this brand's better than that brand. This detail's better than that detail. You see people maturing in their collections and things like that. And I think we've seen that almost in every market that's, that, that's, that's come through. Though now, as we both know, that you know Levi's in particular is a huge explosion, and, and this has to do with the books produced uh, through Burbage and, and Levi Strauss. I mean, the book on five hundred ones, the book on jackets. I mean, there are prices now where I almost feel like you have to check the dailies to see what it's worth today. You know, because the market is so dynamic for some of that stuff that it's hard to keep up on what is the value. What's the value of a pair of World War II pants today. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, know. You're, yeah. I mean, you know? I have no clue because I hardly yeah. ever see that stuff. And you're right; it yeah. is the the market nowadays is moving like crazy, and it's happening I'm for the, the, for the, for every genre. Well, a lot of genres of the market it's happening, and um, it's because it's moving so fast. And, yeah. and that's just not our market. That's just life is just yeah. moving so fast that it, this yeah. just follows, I feel like. and Yeah, and it, it's, it's sort of interesting. We were talking before the show a little bit about the politics and, you know, the, the, the world that we're living in at the moment and hopefully for not too much longer. But, you know, how do you juxtapose that with a $30,000 pair of pants? I mean, how does, how does that fit? 
people were people were concerned about going bankrupt. People were concerned about losing their apartments. People were concerned about getting sick or their parents getting sick. But then there's people looking for a thirty thousand dollar pair of pants. I think I'm not sure I know how to fit those together. I know they're true and I know they're existing at the same time, but I'm not sure how that works really. It's it. You're right, and I I don't get it, and you wonder. Is it an escape for somebody? Is it an investment for somebody? How are they justifying that? And then, yeah, yeah. I, I suspect there's, there's people, you know, trying to fulfill something interior. I mean, I, we all know that there's a certain amount of addiction that comes with collecting. And once again, no judgment there. I mean, I have the same, I have the same affliction. Uh, but uh, but there's a certain amount of it. Maybe there's a motivation there to fill something. The feel something that so you're not feeling afraid, so you're not feeling yeah. afraid. maybe maybe that and of course and, and they, as well. during hard times during depression times they say alcohol and drug abuse is at an all time high and yeah. that is because we we turn to our addictions so yeah. maybe you got something there yeah maybe maybe and also I think <laughs> I think you've got a lot of speculation right now I mean I I'm I fairly often have conversations people talk to me about well. I, I have a, a dead stock pair of leather patch double X's at the moment. And me and a friend hold them. And, the, and we're having the conversation, do we hold them now? Are they going to be worth a lot more a year from now? Are they worth a little bit more? Is the market going to take some sort of, oh, is it going to veer? Is, is the world going to collapse? I mean, you have all these sort of decisions now. When you get into some serious pieces, is how do you play it? And I do this for a living. So generally speaking, my first thought is I'm selling it. But, you know, does, there, there, is, there is speculation in the market now. Whether that's smart or not smart, I don't know. I mean, if you're buying a 100-year-old pair of Levi's right now, that's natural fiber with dye in it. Is it going to exist 100 years from now? Are you going to pass it on to your kids? Is it going to pass it on to their kids? It's unlikely. I mean that that fabric is going to rot away at some point. These these are. I love this things. Conver- I love this topic because I've been thinking about this a lot personally, and especially in today's market, it's ruled by t-shirts, like you, we've said, and yeah. black t-shirts have a tendency to dry rot, especially from late yeah. '80s all through the '90s, even early 2000s. <laughs> black t-shirts will, or a lot of them, will rot away, and. Okay. I'm thinking this, if people are stashing their retirement funds in bins of t-shirts and they open those in 10 years yeah. down the track and half of them are crumbled away, that's going to suck, man. Like, is that a smart plan? I don't really yeah, I don't. It would probably be longer than 10 years, but I think it is to keep in mind, I mean, particularly guys, you know, because there are guys in Japan who have pieces they spend $100,000 or more on. And yeah. I'm thinking about a temperature-controlled room at that point. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, something built somewhere where I've controlled the temperature of the environment so that I'm going to stabilize these pieces. I mean, I've bought pieces that are 100 years old that are just start, starting to crack just on the fold. And once you start getting dry rot on a piece, it usually isn't just localized. So it's just a matter of time, and usually not a lot of time, before you start to see deterioration of other parts of the piece. So usually if I get something that has a little bit of dry rot, I'm moving that piece pretty quickly. And I'm, I'm so not trying to fool anybody, but uh, what yeah. This dry rot, you know, I I typically don't hold a lot of true vintage pieces. And this this happens to different kinds of fabrics. Well wool will so, will yeah. will we'll, we'll get your moths and that's a huge problem. Right. Right. Well, well, we'll actually can dry rot as well. I mean, if you leave it, for instance, if it's on a wire hanger and there's pressure on that, on where it's been hanging in that particular area, you're going to get dry rot. There. It's going to rip through there at some point. You can't, you know, even, but even if you lay pieces flat, leather, of course, is the same thing. Denim, cotton, wool, rayon, all this stuff is the same thing. If it's laying flat in one place for a long time and that fold is there for a long time just sitting there, that amount of pressure and exposure to the air is ultimately going to create a deterioration of the fabric. How, how soon is a year, 10 years, 20 years? I don't know. Yeah, totally. But it is, it's, it's an issue that I think you know, people don't necessarily take into consideration when they're thinking of speculation on these pieces. 
Uh, I have a couple questions, Larry, from yeah. um, other people. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is so out of all the eras of Levi's? What is your personal favorite? Uh, uh, so eras of Levi's. So in terms of collector or personal, like what I would Just, like to wear. I'd say your personal taste. Yeah. My personal taste. I like the '60s and '70s. So I'm I'm wearing actually a, a Levi's Smalley jacket now. I know, I know, but <laughs> but uh, but I like the cut, you know, a five five seven jacket, which is a third edition jacket, sixties jacket. That's a that's a it's a way cooler cut. But it's not as cool to wear because it's cropped so high. It's when guys used to wear their pants a lot higher than we normally wear them now. So and also, I was a teenager in the sixties and the seventies, and so that's a period when I I was wearing Levi's at the time. I wore Levi's jackets at the time. I wore Levi's at the time. So that's really where I, I, I enjoy that period. I enjoy those cuts in, in terms of wearing a little bit, little, little, the legs are a little bit more tapered. Yeah. Not as, pants are not as bellow. Jackets are a little bit more fitted, that kind of thing. A little bit more wearable for today's, today's yeah, guy. I, I, yeah, yeah, I think so. I and think so. Uh, so when you look at 60s Levi's, we're obviously in Big E period. When did the double X end? What year was it? Double X ended, I think, if I, in, Thanks for putting me on the spot here. So double, X, <laughs> double X, and I believe in it somewhere around the mid-60s is when they stopped doing paper patch. So it went from paper patch every garment guarantee to double X. And you, ever, you may have come across this where there are double X's that it has double X on the tag with no rivets on the inside back pockets. And then they went to the 501, 501, the A patches, S patches, and that kind of thing. So mid-60s, I, I think, is accurate. Um, okay, we kind of already talked about this, but somebody asked, how do you date something with no documentation? And, and this is basically going back to your discovery days and you kind of touched on it. I, with just having as much, like just having those pieces and learning through other pieces and comparing, correct? Yeah, I think there's that. I mean, certainly you, you can go through a detailed list I and mean, certain machines were, that they had in the 20s, they didn't have in the 40s in terms of sewing machines. So you can look at the, the stitch on it. How tight is that stitch? certain details. I mean, on work jackets, it has a buttonhole for a watch fob versus not having a buttonhole for a watch fob gives it a certain different different period. Um, so you can look at you know, a variety of things come in. Your experience in handling pieces, oh, I've seen that before. I know where that came from. This is similar, so there go, this is from them. But, you know, there's, and there's a certain amount of guessing that goes on. And, and I've often said to people that I don't consider myself a historian. I'm not, I don't run a museum. I'm not a curator per se. I'm someone who got in the business because I like clothes. I ended up loving this clothes and I can make a living at it. So there are guys out there that know, I mean, they know whether that piece was made in 1921 or 1922. I don't know that. I don't know if it's a 20s piece or I'll know it's a late teens piece or something like that. But that kind of detail is important to a lot of people, and I get it. It adds to some sort of sense of depth of understanding what you're working with. But the way I approach the merchandise and the business is, I love it. I love the piece. Whether it's 1990 or 1919 or 1921 has some interest me to some degree, but mostly what interests me is it's beautiful and I love it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's my attraction to it. I think that, you know, if, if arguably it's a skill is I think I bring at least my interpretation of what I like to the business and what I appreciate. And that if, if there's any skill that I have, that's it. Having a good eye is what I like to think of it. And, and there's guys in the business and this once again, is no value judgment who know tons about what a piece is worth, how much they can get for it, who they're going to sell to but they don't really care about the piece. It's business. And that's okay. I mean, it, business is okay. But I, you know, I, I tend to love the stuff. There are guys that know way more than me about a variety of different things in this business and the pieces. But I don't think there's anybody that loves it more than I do. And I think that's kind of what I bring to the game, if, if uh, anything. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I, I, I can appreciate that answer because I too 
try, I try to learn a lot. I do these podcasts with a lot of people. I'm a very inquisitive person. I ask a lot of questions. And I love talking to my customers about the, the garments to learn more. But there's so much information that I can't retain all this, the dating. Like I can't remember every little thing about every brand and every company. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like I go with the motto that I need to know enough. I, I, I love the business. I love what, what we do. And I, I love the clothes and the details. But I just have to retain enough information to, to, get, to know what I'm dealing with most yeah. of the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, you know, if you're going to do it as a business, you have to know it enough to know whether you're leaving money on the table or not. I mean, that is, that is an important part of the business. Yes, of course. And it's, it's a learning part. And, 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 you know, much to my own dismay, there are days where I think, damn, I should have asked this for that, or I should have asked that for this. And certainly all of us go back in our minds to all the pieces we sold and think, what did I sell that for? Why did I ever sell that? But that being said, I normally have approached it and come to some sort of resolve that there's more stuff out there. Whether or not it's going to be the same piece I sold before is unlikely. But is there going to be something out there that I'm going to find interesting and enjoy and feel excited to have found and to work with and be able to sell to somebody? Yeah, I expect there is. Is there as much as there used to be? No. But I think I still think there's stuff out there and there's still stuff to be learned. I mean, there are yeah. still there are still brands out there that aren't well known. There are still details that people are discovering, and it's it's still a learning process. Even you know, and like I said, for me, you know, watching guys on Instagram or watching some of the younger guys coming up and learning how to do this as a business is exciting as well. Sometimes it's frustrating because you you know I, people have bring their own personalities like they do to everything, and sometimes you you know there's a certain amount of professionalism that you hope to have through certain transactions. Sometimes it doesn't materialize, but nonetheless, it is still an exciting business to be in. And I'm still excited to be doing it. That's awesome. I want to throw back again to a story that I don't know if I heard from you or I heard it from somebody else. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but I'm going to ask anyway. Yeah. Um, did you, get robbed at the Rose Bowl once? So not at the Rose Bowl. We, uh, so in fact, it was 1997. It was the year my son was born. It was a month after he was born. And the Japanese economy had already collapsed. And this was the collapse of their housing market. It was 1997. I mean, guys went from millionaires to nothing overnight. And then a million dollars was a million dollars. So my point was that it was a fairly... A, a dynamic, dramatic time to begin with. My son was so just obvi- obviously this this killed the market for vintage, or they it, stopped coming. It was on the verge. We went we went from we probably lost in one month like 30, 35 percent of our business in one month. Wow. The reason I bring that up is is we went to that Rose Bowl that time with the most product we ever had. We brought everything but the kitchen sink. Wow. And we had we had take we I mean in those days you know, I, I had a lot of people I was buying from. Can I sidetrack I, for one second? You say sure. we. I just want to know who is we, you and your wife, or is we? Did you have a so I, I used to have, you no, know, when I say we, I, I had a staff. You know, when we used to go to the Rose Bowl and set up, because I, I hated the idea of somebody stealing something from me, I would bring like four or five staff people with me. I'd be paid for their hotels, pay for their meals. Because I didn't want stuff stolen. So when I say we, I just meant me and my crew. So you were always a solo show doing your own thing. Well, uh, yes, in terms of ownership. Yeah. yeah. My wife was involved uh, to some degree on the business side of it, but not in the, the product side of it. Uh, but in any case, we rolled up there for a lot of stuff. It was a fairly meager sales. I think we sold 20000 or $30,000 worth of stuff. Not a great shake. Sure, we were loaded with like, a rack of double X's, a rack of A2's, a rack of work. I mean, we just had, we were just packed. And so when you say 20, 30,000 is a low show for the Rose Bowl, I know I've heard from other dealers that, you know, 50 to 50, 75,000 that a Rose Bowl in the heyday was not unheard of, correct? Not unheard of. Yeah, not unheard of. Yeah, which is, For people listening, yeah. that's never been one for us, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but in terms of this story, so we had fairly meager sales and 
what we used to do is we used to, because I brought the staff with me, on Mondays, we would go to a theme park. And so we went to a theme park on Monday, and we had the truck still. So the truck's still there with all our product in it. Plus, I had money on me. And uh, I had somebody driving the truck back to Seattle. And that night, so we had Fun Monday. That night, the truck was parked out outside a motel in Stockton, California, or outside Stockton, California, and somebody sold the whole truck. And we were, ins we were insured, but what we didn't know is that we were only insured up to 100 miles from our warehouse. Oh, we were about, man. We were, about, we were about 900 miles from our warehouse. So our insurance company declined to cover our loss. Um, we figure, I figure we didn't have an exact inventory, but I figure we lost roughly 350000 just in what we paid for it. Not what it was worth, but that's what we paid for. It's about 350000 and they, you know, not to be overly drag about this, but this was coming from someone who started this business on, on waiters tip money, right? Where $5 was a lot of money to me. And so that was something we worked long and hard for both me and my wife. Like I said, my son was just born. It was pretty devastating. It was a pretty, pretty devastating experience. That being said, if that's the worst thing that ever happens in my life, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. We survived it as a business. Uh, it was painful. It was, it was sort of, I mean, it's certainly creepy to think that somebody stalked us, took the truck, sold it to somebody else, somebody who knew it was stolen, obviously would have known it was our stuff. I mean, all those things feel pretty bad, but nonetheless, we survived. Yeah. I mean, horrible things happen to nice people all the time. And, uh, yeah, we just keep on. So, yeah, that, that's almost the hardest thing about theft, I find. And I'm sh like you just mentioned, that, that you, you probably know the people and you have to feel sorry for them. And th obviously they know who you are and they stalked yeah. you. And it's like, I've had things stolen often, nothing to that level. But then, you know, even things where I, things have been stolen from my office and I'm like, you know, the worst part is they're probably one of my staff. And now I, don't, I can't even pinpoint who it was. And then yeah. it's like this betrayal Right, it's a, and it's an excellent word. Yeah, excellent word. It, it, it seems it's, it's, it's almost a betrayal of the social compact. I mean, I, I'm sure that when people saw us at the Rose Bowl, because we came out hard and heavy every time we went out there, came out with a crew, and I, and I imagine some people that they interpreted that as arrogance, or they interpreted that as, you know, me thinking that I was this or that or the other thing. I don't perceive myself that being that way at the time, but I'm sure there were people there. And, and in fact, there were people who told me at the time, as hurtful as it is, that, that I deserved it. <laughs> and I thought, no, I'm not sure how you determine that. But, uh, but in any case, it, it, you know, it, it, it opened, a, it was a lot of stuff. It was a really horrible time when we sold our house because we thought we were going to go bankrupt, that kind of crap. But we didn't. You're here and, to and talk we, about it. Yeah, and we, you know, and and I think, you know, I maintained my position in business for decades after that, in terms yeah. of somebody who had good stuff and paid. For, you know, I mean, in terms, of whatever reputation I have in the business stayed intact for decades after that. And uh, you know, I was, I was sort of happy to have feel like I have that legacy at least at this point. You do, and that uh, that can segue into uh, talking about your book. So you have two books with Rin Tanaka, right? Um, King of Vintage Volume 1, King of Vintage Volume 2, which I don't know if you know this, but I was searching for your book recently because I, I believe I have... This is another thing. I, I've, I've lent books to people to learn over the years and lost certain... I've had all these books over a time, but I'm missing a few now. Um, the King of Vintage is selling for like 500 bucks, that book. Yeah, it was a limited edition. Yeah, the, the original book... Original book was I, I. I like both books, and in fact, we actually did a, another book with the World Press, a mono magazine, and that was also a limited edition, primarily sold in Japan. Softback book. Is that available? To um, I don't know if it's available any longer. I, I, I sort of lost track of that that particular company, but um, that was based on we had we had taken photographs. At one point, we were going to produce our own book, and we had taken 
hundreds and hundreds of photographs of pieces that we had at the time, it never got published. And so we turned that over to this other company. So that, that book is also out there and it's based really uh, on, bef- so it would have been our collection before King of Vintage One. It would have been, you know, maybe a decade before when we had dead stock, you know, buckle backs and stuff like that. that oh, we had wow. collection in those days, yeah. So there's, so there's three books, but King, you know, Rin, Rin Tanaka, the great thing about working with Rin, Rin Tanaka is that Rin is an excellent photographer and has a working knowledge of the business, but he also allowed me to come in and say, yeah, I know you like that photo, but I don't like that piece. So let's not use that one. And let's make this a full page and this a half page, that kind of, so he allowed me to have some input on it. And I think that, at least in my opinion, helped make it a little bit more interesting because I, I kind of knew the details I thought maybe collectors might look for. And I wasn't interested at the time in doing a encyclopedia of denim or vintage. What I was interested in, as I said before, is showing people pieces I loved. People have pointed out to me since then some of the inaccuracies of some of the dates and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> right? you got me. You know, you got me. But once again, I think it showed, and I think particularly for that period, you know, before you could go out and find stuff all over Instagram and stuff, when that book came out, you did not see those pieces out that we had in our collection, we had it in our showroom. But for the general world to see it, that stuff was not out there. I mean, 19... 20s West Point sweater with like the number on the inside and the name. I mean, just these things that were kind of essentially one of a kind, you didn't see that out there. And so that was what was fun about that book is that we could show it, even though Ren and I at the time, and Ren may have been more confident than I was, I had owned a lot of this collection for a long time. This is a time where we could hold a collection and not sell it. And I thought, I don't know if people are going to give a crap. I, I literally thought at the time, I don't know if anybody's going to care. I thought this could either really help make my career or this could be really like ruin my career. And I honestly, until the first uh, King of Inspiration show, the first show that they had at the hangar, yeah. I didn't know if it was going to work or not work. And I was so elated. I got to say, that was one of the highlights of my career in my life. To realize at that moment that it was a success. And it wasn't like it was a huge financial success, no. but people liked it. And I thought, yeah. wow, great. And that's what I think, you know, you know there's, I think that, and that's awesome that I was there and I, I got the book and I remember like studying it in, uh, immensely because I'm like, some of this stuff is so interesting and unique. It had a lot of pieces that, you know, you're probably never going to find, but just to, you know, they were all interesting pieces. And yeah. when, when you do something like that, like you're putting that book out there, you're putting out your hard work, your energy, your collection to the world. It lived well beyond that day, that year, that month. And it's now it's there. It's like you've, you've put something out there for the people to appreciate for forever now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm thrilled that Rin gave me the opportunity. I'm thrilled that I got to be, um, to fill that position, you know, gain that image. I mean, I, there are, and I've, and I've said this a lot, and this is, this is not false, false modesty. There are great dealers out there. There are guys out there that have great collections. There's guys out there, and I will not mention their names, who have better collections than I have. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad that we got to show what we were doing at the time, what I loved at the time, and got the recognition. I mean, I, I, I can't say that I'm not proud of it because I am. Does that mean I'm the only guy out there doing good stuff and got great stuff? Absolutely not. There are guys out there who are still killing it, you know, who are still got great collections and love it. I mean, there, there, there are tons of peers out there of guys doing great stuff in the business. And when you look at your life, your, your career, your time in vintage, which is basically your whole life, what were some of those moments that you think got you to where you are right now? Because you are, like I said in the beginning, recognized as the king. You're recognized as, as basically the leader in high-end, rare, collectible vintage and to me and so many people. So like, like you said, there's a lot of other people doing it out there. What were some of the turning points that possibly, if you can recognize any of them, got you to this 
Does yeah, I think, I think, you know, I think that it was really almost, there, there was no one moment like, aha, now I'm there. It was just sort of my approach to it. I think, you know, it, once again, this is not to quibble with how anybody else does the business. Of course, yeah. But my, my approach to being willing to make very little on a piece just because I loved it and I could handle it and do it, I didn't do that because I wanted to become famous as somebody doing that. I did it because that's how I am a person do it. That's just how it made sense to me. But doing it that way and taking, and I was lucky enough to learn this business step by step. I didn't go from A to Z in six months. It took me years and years and years and thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions and pieces to sort of do this. Uh, you know, the, maybe at one point, at some point, we decided not to do regular merchandise anymore. So I focused more on the vintage. But even before then, our vintage was very strong. But I think that, I think that in the transactions that I've done with people, is that, you know, that they can sense that I love it, that I love the stuff. Yeah, they know I want to make the money. Sometimes they're mad at the price. Sometimes they beat me on the price. All those experiences happen. But I think that the idea of, in, you know, for me, this has made me, you know, if, if I can walk away with any sense of satisfaction from having done this, is the sense that I got to do it the way I am, who I am. And there are people who do their business the way they are, and they do it a lot better than I do in many ways, but they're not doing it the way I am. And so the way that I've done it, turned out to be successful in many ways. There are other guys who made a lot more money than I've made in this business in a variety of ways. The theft didn't help. I mean, that certainly took a lot away from us. But nonetheless, there are guys who've been way smarter about business than I have. But once again, I don't think anybody loves it more than I do. And I think that the way I feel about the pieces, my sense of how I determine my own ethics and my own rights and wrongs of how I deal with people is sort of played out in the business. Some people I think have perceived that as being a fair way. Maybe some haven't, I don't know. But I think those, that, you know, just, I got to do it my way and I got to get recognized for it. And it's awesome. that's, that's been fun. That's the beauty of this business. You know, that is part of why people are drawn to it. You can do it your own way. And I think you know, especially early on that you did that and that you didn't fit into, say, a mold or a box that people perceive to be the right way to do something. You decided to do yeah. your own way. Yeah. I think that's always the way to go. I think well, there the were guys, you know, at the time, there were guys mad at me because I would tell people, I'd give people, you know, somebody to ask me about a piece. I wouldn't necessarily give up everything I knew, but I would tell people about pieces and I would give them what I thought was fair prices. And there were guys that were just other dealers seriously mad at me. Like, why the heck are you telling these? They don't know that. You don't need to tell them that. And I thought, that's how I do it. That now they're going to sell me. Right? That's I can how I relate, do it. Larry. There's people that hate that I do this, that I'm doing this with you right now. Right. You know, but we're we're having a chat and we're talking about our lives. So yeah, I can yeah. appreciate that. And for a long time, we've talked about the Rose Bowl. You know, you used to come see us at the hotel. We talked about how like the Rose Bowl is not the first showing anymore. And you were part of that right. because you would come to our hotel and you'd probably go see a lot of people pre-Rose Bowl in that era. And I, I'm sure when it happens again, you probably still do it. Now, there was a long period when me and Jesse would, we look at a piece and we're like, this is a Larry piece. This is a Larry piece. <laughs> like we, you literally were out picking and you find something and your name will come up because it's like, we know... Right. Like you said, when you're picking, you have a home for something already. It's sold, right? right. right. So there's years when we're we're uh, we're finding stuff, and it's it's definitely going to you. And um, you know, we would hit you up directly, or you come to the hotel and you buy a few pieces. And then, you know, I can think of certain pieces like we sold you a, a white black bear bear dead stock chin strap work jacket one time that I can remember that was a beautiful piece. Yeah. Um, and there's been all these pieces throughout the history, but then eventually it got to a point where like your business changed for, to be, I guess, well, there's two things. We, the, the availability of these things that are rare and that you like are getting harder to find. And then 
maybe that your taste went very particular into I'm only going to specialize in certain things. So my question kind of is, at what points were like you're changing your lane? Because I'll tell another thing. Me and Jesse visited you once in your studio in Seattle. I don't know if you remember. We were super young. We were like, yeah. it was like 2006. Yeah. You had, um, you know, you had this beautiful counter at the front that had some very old relics of denim in it. Yeah. And then you had your room. It wasn't huge. Lined with racks, stuff hanging. Then you had uh, fabric laundry bins in the middle of the room. Right. And I can remember there was a whole bin, I think, of vintage skate t-shirts yeah. in your studio. And at that point, like, we're skaters. So we're like, right. wow, this is like, <laughs> this is stuff from our childhood. We're like, this is, you have a whole bin of this stuff? Yeah. And obviously, that was 2006, 2007, maybe. And then I know now you 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 wouldn't buy any of that stuff. So where were the points when you changed your lane to go in maybe more particular directions? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I can't remember any specific moment or any specific decision. I think essentially I would just go where the market was and where the accessibility was. I think that you know with you guys as an example is that I mean at some point it became a better business decision for you guys to sell vintage to guys who are buying bulk items from you, right? And that is, that's a legitimate way to do it. If somebody's spending 50,000 on champion sweatshirts and t-shirts, and you've got a couple, a couple of pairs of double X's that they want for $500 cheaper than you can sell them to me, that makes perfect sense to me. So what is certainly happened in my mind is, is that I have to focus on a piece. My focus has to be sort of laser because the profit margin is going to be tight. And in terms of risk, I have to watch where is that risk at, at the moment. And once again, we were just talking about this, and this is a little further down the, uh, down the period than what you're discussing. But if we're talking about now, I am very cautious about what I buy, very cautious. It's not that I don't perceive certain value in pieces or for certain profit. But in terms of a risk, I have to think of, how quick am I going to sell that? How much am I going to make? And does it make sense to take this certain amount of my budget and invest it here when something else may come up here that is going to be more marketable or more in the trend now and stuff like that? So a variety of things come into, you know, in terms of where my, where my focus is. But primarily I've had to go to... There's a part of me that always wants to see something I haven't seen, right? If I, if, if I love, I'll be happy to buy double X's all day long. But, you know, unless it's a dead stock pair or some sort of nuance on it, it is, it's business. It's not that I don't like it. It's not that I don't enjoy handling it, but it's business. But that time I see a piece or a brand that I've never seen before or a detail I've never seen before, or something that dawns on me that hasn't dawned on me before. That's really sort of where it becomes exciting. And I think that's kind of where my focus goes, is I'm constantly trying to, and I have to juggle like all of us, the business aspect of what I do with what keeps me interested in doing it. Yeah. And, and then that, those those things that you haven't seen get harder to find as time goes on because it, you've, it, it you've seen more, of course. It does. And in fact... I won't go into details because it's a little bit sensitive, but I, I just rejected a piece essentially that uh, is a hard to find piece. I'm not going to be any more specific. Than that. Very hard to find piece. I rejected a certain price, made a business decision. The guy sold the piece within two days for more than I, more than he wanted to sell it to me for. Now I have to look at that and go, wait a minute. One of us screwed up. The guy that bought that piece doesn't know what he's doing or I don't know what I'm doing. And at this point in the market, it's hard to tell on some pieces what that is. Because I've seen that specific piece, I've seen a hundred of them similar to that. But there are guys in the market who have never had that piece. So they may be willing to pay more for it because they've never seen it, never had it. Where I looked at it and thought, well, the button's been changed. That one's ripping. Those, those straps aren't original. I mean, just... I evaluate it in a sense based on my experience and kind of the level of not so much a bar that I have, but just 
you know, basically how I evaluate a piece. Like, no, that's got all these problems. Where somebody else looked at me and said, I don't care about those problems. I'll take it. Or I didn't notice those problems. Or it doesn't matter. Whatever their decision process is. But that's how it's kind of different for me. Is that I have, you know, going on 35 years of experience to some degree doing this. And it may in some fact, in some ways be a disadvantage for me now because some pieces now are rare that never used to be rare or they're more rare than they used to be or the market's more forgiving on the condition than it used to be. But I still have a frame of mind of what, what I think makes a good piece or not a good piece or what makes an acceptable condition, not an acceptable condition. So that's sort of kind of a double-edged sword for me. You know, I think that I, I win in some ways having had the experiences I've had and the knowledge that I, that I think that I have. In some ways, it can work against you, too, because it, you know, there is a contemporary market out there, as we talked about, that's moving very, very fast. Very yeah. fast. <clears throat> and and um, it's hard to judge. You exactly. don't get the, like that person that bought that garment had the adding that excitement feeling for that garment because of whatever reasons in their own right. life and you right. didn't because of whatever reasons and then you're right it didn't line up but right. again it's like a risk versus reward thing you know that, that could have gone the other total way and then you're at a then you're at a loss so yeah you know it, it, it's the double-edged sword is tricky man it's tricky which yeah. way to go on those decisions and i it, see that a is. lot like yeah. with what's happening in the modern market because I will tell people like this is this is very much a, a regular ordinary piece. You know, right. some things that I would put out my on my store in my store for fifteen dollars now right. are in the hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And I'm like, how did this happen so fast? It's changing, <laughs> and why are you so excited about it? But yet, right. I'm not in their head to, to understand right. it. Right, and I, it's it, it's a and I and I think you know all the experiences that I've had in the business, all the experiences you've had in the business everybody in the business has had some version of that. And there are times where I'll feel like I'll bemoan to myself a piece that I sold, I wish I had back, whatever reason, or a piece I sold too cheap, or where I passed on a piece, whatever it is. But now I'll talk to somebody else in the business, and they've all had, we've all had those experiences. And it's actually kind of nice to know so you don't feel like yeah. you're the only guy out there banging on stuff. Because, it, 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 you know, it, it, particularly when we, we've got the virus now and a variety of things are going on where you can feel some sense of not necessarily isolation, but distance. And then you've got a changing market. So it creates a certain kind of like what's going on. I find myself having to really think about what I'm doing. And so much of what I've done before, we're usually particularly when businesses are slamming, is you work instinctually. You work based on your information. I mean, yeah, you're thinking about what you're doing, but a lot of it's instinct. But now you have to, to some degree, pull away from the instinct and actually think about the decisions. And sometimes that works for you and sometimes it doesn't. And that, that's kind of where I find myself right now in the business. And the, the physical reality of, of a Rose Bowl or meeting a customer and selling them and having an appointment is so different than the online interactions that oh, yeah. are going on right now. And it, yeah. it, when you even, so I went to, I went to Melrose flea market, which isn't really a vintage market, but there's people selling, you know, vintage there, t-shirts mm -hmm. and things. And just going there after having the lockdown of six months and not really doing an event like that, it was such an eye opener to me. Cause I'm like, everyone's stuck into this virtual way of doing things and then yet there still is this real life aspect of it and they are very disconnected i find yeah right now and um it's uh yeah it's 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 crazy it's it's, it's hard to adapt i find yeah and I, I think it'll be interesting to see you know what i mean consumerism in general and collect specifically with collectibles be interested to see where it goes in the next 20 years I and mean, there's a there's a pushback against consumerism now for a variety of really, really good reasons. It'd be interesting to see if that has any effect on what people consider collectibles. I mean, I don't imagine you think of a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, are people going to be making nylon jackets? I think not. I think there'll be some sort of technology 
It makes you look like you're wearing a nylon jacket versus wearing a nylon jacket, right? I mean, you think about, are we ever, are we going to be using our resources to actually make physical goods at some point? It'd be interesting to see where, where that all goes. But in the short term, relatively short term, be interesting to see how this pushback is because there's a big pushback in denim now. I mean, everybody knows it takes a gazillion gallons of water to make one pair of denim pants. And, you know, and there's a huge pushback on that. How is that going to affect contemporary market is yet to be determined, but how will that affect the vintage market? Will that make things more interesting and more rare and more desirable or they'd be look at, looked at as an access and an indulgence. I mean, I, it would be interesting yeah. in my mind to see what's going I on. believe it's the former. I believe it will make it more desirable in the long term when, you know, these big corps, these big companies get the pushback and then they, they realize that they need to stop pumping out crappy products yeah. and filling this void. And people start to go, you know, let's buy something that's going to last me, you know. And why not buy a vintage? But again, you're right. Yeah. It's uh, to be determined. Back to your personal taste right now for a sec. Sure. What sure. is it that, is there any garments you can think that you are, it's tricky because you're saying you want to see something you haven't seen. So you don't like, that's a, you don't know what you don't know scenario until you see it. Right. But is there any garments that you do know that you're looking for or that you're after that really excite you right now? Uh well, there's such a focus on denim right now, and there's such a focus on Levi's. At one point, uh, I don't know if you know this, Levi Strauss had a contest for the oldest Levi jacket known. They had a contest. When was this? Well, having a bad memory, I'm going to say at least 15 years ago, maybe 20. Okay. And I, in fact, bought from, in fact, Mike Manperl what I think was the oldest model of Levi jacket that, that, that they made. Didn't, didn't have a tag, but the details on it were extraordinary. The pocket was lower and smaller. It had selvage completely throughout the jacket. The buttons were smaller. I mean, it had all these sort of subtle details, but not so subtle distinctions. Really. And how would you even know it was Levi's if it didn't have a tag? Yeah, oh, it, it would have had Levi's buttons. Okay. Yeah, it had Levi's but Levi's rivets. So, but this was extremely early. I, you know, I, and I'm not, I'm not positive. And in fact, the jacket, the jacket got found out of a dumpster. And foolish enough, the story that I wrote, because Levi Strauss won the story where the jacket came from. I'd sent him a picture and I told him it came out of a dumpster. Well, surprise, surprise, I didn't win the contest. <laughs> Partly because I assume marketing wise, they don't want to say that the jacket that one came out of a dumpster. But uh, as far as I know, that is the earliest model. I would love to find one of those again. That to me would be like just to see, because I, I owned it in a period of time where, you know, business was tough, the market was, there's a lot of stuff in the market, and I appreciated it. Maybe not as much as I should have at the time. In fact, it went through auction, a Christie's auction, and sold for almost nothing because I didn't know enough how to do an auction and sort of got taken advantage of, at least that's my perspective. And uh, uh, so I'd love to find, you know, something from that period. So it essentially was similar to a first, but a lot of different details. Well, it was a first. It was a first jacket, but just it was early version. Just okay. the distinctions made it extremely early but wasn't the, was there not any levi's jackets made pre-first edition that were just like um totally different styles yeah that you know i don't know that i don't okay. know i don't i is as best i can tell they must have made a levi's seemingly they made a levi's jacket in the 1890s now uh, you can get into you know their sack coats and stuff like that from levi's that i've had and you get in, you can get into World War One. Levi's made stuff, you know. World War One, different companies made uh, denim for for the military. It was called private purchase, and so essentially, they, they would give the specs to the manufacturers. Manufacturers make these products, and then you, as a military guy, would go into a store and buy it, and it would be made to be made to the military specs. So Levi's made stuff during World War One. And so, there's, so have you, know, you have you had stuff from that? I have, yeah, wow. I have. 
Yeah. And and the difference there is that they're making it to military spec. Military, so it's a military garment. It exactly. would just have on the tag, or how would you know? So would it would be, be tagged. Yeah. So it, it would, you know, often. So it could have the tag on it. Could say Lee or Levi's. Uh, it could have, uh, you know, it could have on on the pocket tag inside. It could say it'll say who the manufacturer was. So those pieces are really, really hard to find. Levi's in particular is very, very difficult to find. Lee did more than Levi's, as best I can tell. And they certainly did it up in World War II. You'll see World War II garments made with military specs by Lee, or you'll see it made by different manufacturers for the war effort. But these were actually with military spec tags in them. Yeah. World War II. But a lot of World War One, yeah, didn't have proper tagging because it was spec tags, yeah. yeah, I didn't have spec tags. Yeah. Interesting. I see I didn't know that. Learn something every day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Larry, I could keep asking you questions all day here, man. Like this <laughs> you know, I I'm flattered that you uh, you decided to contact me. I, I, I appreciate it. As, as you can tell, I mean like all of us, I love this and I could probably talk all day about it. I'm not sure everybody <laughs> wants to listen. But, but. No, that's great. And I was a little nervous to ask you to tell you the truth because I wasn't sure how you would you would uh, take it, but um, no, nah, this is all really cool, man. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. Well, I appreciate it. I, appreciate um, I do want to talk a little bit about, you said before you, your first big break or one of your first big breaks was flying to Japan Yeah. with that first load of dead stock. And then I know you, so I know that you are probably one of the most traveled to Japan humans <laughs> from mm-hmm. America. Like you, you yeah. literally, I think you told me you go every month. Well, you know, I think at one point I was going about every six weeks. Okay. Yeah, just about every six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot of trips to Japan. Yeah. And um, I think back to our early days going to California. And I think before we even sold at the Rose Bowl, we actually attended an auction, a live auction Mm -hmm. that was held in Pasadena at a hotel downtown. Mm -hmm. You remember this? Flying to Sasha. Flying this auction. Okay, that's it. Yeah. And you sold there, but it wasn't just your auction. It was a, it was a group of people. No, generally speaking, that my I, you know I would usually put a lot of stuff in there, and okay. then there were other guys that consigned as well. Usually, my stuff would be the most stuff in there, but but generally speaking, the, yeah, there were a handful of guys that would consign to this auction. Yeah. I I just want to talk about these auctions a bit because a lot of what's going on now in the young contemporary market of t-shirt vintage is live auctions. They're doing them online. But, you know, I I keep telling everyone it's been going on for a long time and it's probably been going on as long as Japan's been in this business. And Mm -hmm. as you know, like I said, 15 years ago, I went to one of yours. Yeah. Were those good? Were those good? Like, did you usually do well? Or were were those terrible? They're terrible. Terrible. (laughs) Terrible. (laughs) Yeah. Normally, normally what would happen is that, you know, the way my business model worked, if I can use that term, is that I would have a piece X amount of time. You can only show a piece a couple of a handful of times or a certain amount of times before you got to bury it. So either you got to put it away for a couple of years until it seems fresh again, or you got to sell it. Well, as a business model, I can't put everything away for a couple of years. I've got to sell stuff particularly if it was a bad buy or an off buy or whatever the dynamics of the buy were pieces. So the auction became a way of me essentially just recouping some of my investment. Generally speaking, I lost money without a doubt every time. But uh, there were pieces that did well. I, in fact, I I don't know if you know this, I I actually had my own auction at at one point. In Japan? Uh, No, in, in the United States. Yeah, and it was done by Flying Deuce Auction, but it was just my stuff. We printed a catalog, did all that stuff, and it went fairly poorly. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, I overestimated a variety of things. But it was a learning experience. But no, Flying Flying Deuce became an ends to a means to me or means to an ends. Is that yeah. I essentially had to go somewhere with my Plan B stuff, some place where there might be some competitiveness buy it and that's what fly and deuce was it's primarily for now yeah. on occasion they would come up with their own stuff i i would also buy from this auction and there were times that i've got great stuff i'm just amazing stuff these guys were from uh idaho and they surprised enough would come I mean, they came up with a pair of dead south world war ii pants one time or they came up with 
you know, a dead stock denim jumper made by the Mormon church from around 1909. I mean, just stuff would pop up there. So it wasn't just a way of selling. There were also viable pieces in this auction at times and and different, different days. But uh, generally speaking, my approach and my, my need for the auction was to move my grade B stuff along. I bought a piece. You remember inspiration? Was it inspiration round two that was on the Queen Mary boat? I don't remember, but it was one of those. It yeah, it was two or three or something like that. They had an auction at the one, and yes. I bought a second edition baby jacket and um, double X baby pants. This is when my wife was pregnant with our first son. Right. He basically never wore them because they're very uncomfortable to actually wear for a baby. Right, right. right. <laughs> but I still have I get them. Those on a kid with the diaper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, they're just keepsakes at this point. But I remember that first auction. I remember it. It was exciting. It's exciting to get in the ring there and like bid on things. And yeah, auctions are dangerous. I mean, if you go into an auction, unless you have a lot of discipline, you can spend a lot more than you want it to, and also. You know, the other side of it is you can be sitting on your hands while something great goes down just because you were glitching and and it just happens happens to sell. And you suddenly go, wait, what what did that sell for? Excuse me, can we put that piece back up? And uh, yeah, auctions, <laughs> auctions are auctions can be tricky. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Larry, that is about it for today, man. Oh, I, for- I had I had a um. I had a couple questions here, but they were kind of not that exciting. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna. I hope I hope that is not indicative of how interesting this is going to no, be. No, this is. I mean, you basically covered everything, and you basically just naturally we covered everything that I wanted to go over. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I like I said, this was very exciting for me to chat to you, man. I there's such a cool history, and I think the people who listen to the show are going to be so excited because a lot of them don't know how this business got founded and how this business started. And it's, uh, you know, you're, you are a pioneer. Yeah. Well, I, I got lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And, and I, I, I sincerely am grateful for that. I sincerely am grateful for that. And you are still rocking. The business is still going. I'm still doing it. I don't know about rocking, but I'm still doing it. And I still get pieces. I got a prototype, uh, not to, tip my hand too much, but I got a seemingly yeah, prototype's not the correct word, but I got a Levi jacket that I had never seen before recently. And that's, uh, that's exciting. I can't, I can't say much more about it because it went to a collector, but uh, it was a piece that when I first saw it, I thought it was fake because the details were just wrong. And it took me a couple of days of literally staring at this picture going, wait a minute that's not wrong. That's just a different kind of right. And uh, so, yeah, I still get stuff and I still get excited and yeah, I'm still out. I'm still out doing it. The last thing I do want to touch on is you have your own brand and I know you have partners within it, but there you got so big within the vintage world and within the fashion world. And we didn't, that's another thing we didn't even touch on. We didn't even touch on designers using you as inspiration, but I'm sure you have a rich history in renting and dealing with designers, correct? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I do want to talk about that if you don't mind keeping going yeah. for a few minutes. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, when you look at design and you look at modern fashion, everybody is using clothing to reference. And a big part of your business was probably renting pieces, correct? It was. At on one, yeah. one point, it was a, a good portion of our business, huh? And, you know, who are some of the, can you speak on that? Who are some of the brands and like, how do they, well, I, we, dealt they most, we dealt mostly with domestic brands. We didn't get too much of the European. Now I know some people place like New York and Los Angeles because of their proximity and being a destination point, they ended up getting more, some, some European uh, buyers and renters and designers and stuff. But primarily ours was American. Uh, I think we did most of our business with Polo. And we did most of our business with Double RL. Uh, I think I think Double RL is you know there are a few brands in the market. Mister Freedom is one of them, and Double RL, of course, is another. Where I think 
there are other contemporary brands I'm sure they're very good I'm not quite as familiar with. But those two particular brands have an amazing ability to take a 1920s body with a 1930s pocket, marry them together, and create a piece that I think is attractive and not Frankenstein. Not sort of like, well, why the hell did you put that there? They, they both, as brands, seem to be able to take samplings from different pieces, different periods, and create something that seems to have some depth to it, but also is attractive and contemporary. And, and I, I love that about them. I, I, I love that about both those brands. I mean, Christoph. Do, do, do you want to, <laughs> yeah, you want to reference any brands that do it terribly? Uh, no, no, I, I think, I think those brands will stand out for themselves, but you know, I, I, oh, and Christoph is probably bored to tears to see me because I do two things every time I see him. Christoph, who owns Mr. Freedom, the creator of Mr. Freedom is one is I tell him I hate him is because he's so good. And the other thing is the reason that I tell him I hate him is because he's so good. So there's two things I always say to him <laughs> that I just find, I find, I find him creative without really an ego that goes with that. And I, I really find his product refreshing. But for me, it's important that it has some sense of depth, at least with my perspective and maybe my background in vintage. When I look at what he does, it resonates with me. And that's the same with Double RL. I think I would believe I that did. is the ultimate compliment, Larry, that you appreciate. I call it like a uh, like a mishmash or a wild style garment, but you appreciate the way that they mix it. It means the world, like I would say as a compliment, because you've seen it all. You've seen all the original garments that each of these yeah. inspirations are coming from. Yeah. I, I, I have often thought that I, I'm not a, I'm not a creative person per se. I'm not someone, at least at this point in my life, has been able to go, oh, I'm going to do all this, but I can recognize it. And once again, if I think if I have any talent, you know, and this is all arguable, but if I have any <laughs> talent, if I have any talent, I believe it's recognizing things at least that I like. And, uh, you know, when I look, when I, and, uh, you know, I, I do go out there and I do look at Mark, I do look at clothing, I do look at new clothing. At one point in particular, I made a, a when I would go to Japan, of going to as many new stores with new brands as I could to see what was going on, see what people were doing. And so much of it is derivative. So much of it is nonsense and so poorly made. And just looking at it, you think, this is meaningless. This is just meaningless as a piece. Not even just poorly made, not in that sense, but just you look at it and think, this has nothing to it. It's mimicked the things it's supposed to mimic, but it has no depth, it has no authenticity, it has no sincerity. But you look at some, when you see people do it, once again, like when you see Double RL do it, or you see Kristoff do it, or, you know, uh, you know, Mike Hodas do it, the Rising Sun. I mean, these guys, I mean, they're, they're passionate, they love it, they get it, and they know how to do it. And it's, it really is great to see. It, it, it's yeah, exciting yeah. for me. I, uh, I have known Kristoff from the beginning of going to Rose Bowl as well. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen him in a long time. I don't. Even, we're not like I wouldn't even consider us really like that close. But I did go to his shop a few times before he moved in Hollywood to directly sell him some garments. He bought a, um, a is it a B seven the shearling long coat? Yeah, he bought a B yeah. seven from us. White, white B seven. Yeah. yeah, which yeah. is such a cool garment, yeah. and it was one of my first ever. Actually, it was my first day, like really picking as a business. I found that jacket and I sold it to him. And wow, that's that was, fine for first day picking as a business. No shit, I that's was a like, rare jacket. and at the time, I had no idea that it was what it was. The only thing that I knew was like that's a U.S. Air Force insignia, and I was yeah. like, this, I'm taking this, right? So yeah, I'll buy this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's so then. Well, we still have, while we started on this tangent was um, you became so well known that you now have Heller's Heller's brand, and I want you to kind of speak to that a little bit. So we're not currently making Heller's brand. I have a warehouse company, and I we had a collaboration for approximately ten years, and uh, it it was a it, you know it's 
collaborations are difficult. And I don't mean to suggest that this was not a good collaboration because it was. I, in fact, one of the first meetings I had with Warehouse, you know, we, we actually really had never met each other before and went up and we immediately started discussing doing a collaboration together. But in the negotiations and discussing the parameters and what this might look like, I would pose what might be a complication or a problem or something to be figured out. And immediately we would come to the same conclusion of how to resolve that. It's like we really had, were on the same page immediately which was sort of an interesting thing because I, you know, as, as you know, our business, now you and your brother, of course, do this together and have a, a camaraderie, but for a lot of guys doing this business, it's not necessarily solo or isolating, but to some degree you're percolating on your own. You're you know, doing things kind of internally. So for me to meet two guys and we sort of mesh like right off the top on reasonably obscure kind of complicated things was was pretty interesting to me. So we had we did have a, a good relationship. Business is a funny thing. I mean, it's you know collaborations and vintage and a reproduction line, if that was what it can be called. All those are a variety of complications that go into that kind of relationship. So uh, it was it was a great experience. I learned a lot with them. I think we produced a lot of great stuff. I have some discussion with them, maybe to do a little bit smaller line. I think for us, what happened is it got to be too complicated of a line. It got too large. And when you have community, I live in the United States, they're in Japan. I mean, that's a lot of, gee, does this look right to you? And is this stitch okay? What about that color? I mean, there's a lot that goes into developing brands beyond just having a silhouette of something you think is cool. So, uh, it, but it was a great experience. It was, it was a great experience, and I still have a good friendship with those guys. That's awesome. I did. Uh, so, it, so it's currently out of production. How long has it been out of production? Uh, two, two, about two, two, maybe three years. Okay. Yeah, though I still get, I still get requests from people emailing me wanting pieces. So there's still some some interest in the brand as a brand to some degree. Yeah. Okay, Larry, how can people find you? They can follow you on Instagram. You're, you're, you're Heller's Cafe, correct? Yeah, Heller's Cafe official, yeah. Um, do you have a website? We do, but that's not all that active. But if you want to get a hold of me, hellers at hellerscafe.com is my email address. And uh, I'm usually more or less answer all the responses. Do you have any uh, final words for the people no, you know, I, I think I would go back to how we started this is that, you know, I'm sort of towards the end of part of my career. And there's a lot of guys at the beginning. And I, it makes me happy to see that there's still guys coming up, doing this, loving this. We may not have the same vision on what's this or what's that or what they like and what I like. But I'm thrilled to see that there's that movement of these generations coming up through this. And if, if I've had any ability to influence it or even be recognized by it, I, I think that's a, that's a great compliment and a great thrill for me. I love it. I think that is perfect. Yeah. You have influenced it. You have influenced myself and all the people in my generation. And it just trickles down through these generations. And I'm so happy that you can appreciate it and not be jaded by it. And I think uh, that's great, Larry. I think that's great. Well, thank you, Drew. Thank you. All right. Thank you for tuning into the podcast, everyone. Mad love. I appreciate you all. Please go check out the Patreon. Like I said, this is a podcast funded by the people. For the price of a cup of coffee a month, you can support me. If you saw me on the street, would you buy me a cup of coffee? For dropping all these podcasts? If the answer is yes, please go support the Patreon. Much, much appreciated. Check out fsandfrankvintage.com. Like this video. Share this video. All that good shit. See you on the next one.